Well, as most of you know, this weekend we had a marriage encounter here at the church. We had 28 in attendance, which was uh, exceeded my expectations. Thank you, and I'm sure all of you who attended were encouraged from that. Since uh, Denny Coburn uh, came, was coming to Defiance for the weekend, we thought, hey, it'd be a good idea just to have him bring a, a message of encouragement for us here this morning. So Denny agreed to stay one more night and uh, to bring us a message of encouragement. And I myself, I said this yesterday, I'm encouraged every time that I hear Denny speak. Uh, any time that God can use anybody that old is an encouragement for me. So, uh, Denny, the pulpit yours. <clears throat> Gotta say, you can tell the way that I'm dressed that I'm an old guy. Uh, I'd like to have a lovely assistant, and I've asked Dan if he would come to assist me. And we're gonna play a little game. Some of these songs you used saying I didn't know. Now I'm gonna see how much you know about the old songs. So what I'm gonna do is gonna read some third verses. If you recognize the full name of that hymn, raise your hand. My lovely assistant will recognize you. <laughs> and if you know the name, then, uh, uh, then you get some prizes. Now what we have, if it's down in here somewhere, these are, uh, uh, grippers, you know, hey, you have to grip things uh, uh, to get the lid off. And these are Barnabas things. And if you take them out of this package, they make a wonderful indoor frisbee. And if you get it, you get one of them. You also get, for the coming winter, Barnabas lip balm. There you go. You get one of the, if you get it, it's right, you get all three of these. And these candy corns for the year. So. Okay. All right, now you take all that and they get one of each, but okay. raise your, if you holler without raising your hand, we're going to have to take you out in the parking lot and work you over because this is this and that. So, so raise your right front paw and my lovely assistant will recognize you and uh, I'm going to see if you recognize this hymn. Very familiar hymn, third verse. Here it is. The Lord has promised good to me. His word my hope secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. Do you know that one? Raise your hand. What is it? What did she say it was? We're marching to Zion. No, she's wrong. <laughs> okay. Write the original, the, the hymn name you know. Does anybody else know it? Okay. Was there another one over here? He's strong. What is it? Amazing Grace. Amen, you got it. All right, bless your heart. That's one in a row. Got a string going here. <laughs> this next one you ought to know, as soon as my, uh... by the way, your preacher, I love your preacher, we've emailed back and forth, but his head reminds me of heaven. <laughs> it's a bright and shining place with no parting there. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> all right. <laughs> <laughs> Preacher Appreciation Week. All right, here it is. Third verse. Raise your right front paw. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toil he doth richly repay. Not a grief nor a loss, not a frown nor a cross, but is blessed. What is it? What is it? Trust and obey, amen. That's two in a row. Man, we're a string going here now. Now where we are. And one more. Hey, you might not know this one. This is uh, not one that we sing often, but you older people <laughs> might recognize this one. Here it is. You better read this so you'll recognize it if they get it right, okay? See, here, here's the name of it. Okay, you got it? Okay, here you go. Third verse. Now I have a hope that will surely endure after the passing of time. I have a future in heaven for sure, there in those mansions sublime. And it's because of that wonderful day when at the cross I believed, riches eternal and blessings supernal from his blessed hand received. 
Come on, don't embarrass the old guy. Heaven came down. Amen. That's good. Thank you very much. <laughs> I want to thank you for the invitation of being here. Uh, of course, I'm at the age I'm thankful to be anywhere. But I've had a rich life, uh, even though I'm old now. I've, I've, a, I've a, a bungee cord jumped. I have jumped out of a perfectly good airplane. I have run a marathon. I have went down the New River in a raft. And I've had a good life. So just whatever I do now, excuse me, because I've been around for a long time. When you go, uh, start to get old, you forget things. And I was sharing in the older class that I was with that last week I forgot the Alamo. <laughs> Some of you don't get that. <laughs> I was telling my wife, what's her name about that? And she didn't. <laughs> okay. I went to a memory class one time, and on the way back, a guy asked us his... Uh, well, what was the name of the instructor? And I said, well, here's how it works. You just associate things. I said, what's that flower that's prickly and it's red and it smells pretty? He said, roses. I said, that's it. Hey, Rose, what's the name of that group? We went, <laughs> you got to put things together. If you have your Bibles, turn them to the book of Acts. I begin Barnabas' ministry. Let me say one other word to you older people. You know, at the end of this month, kids will be out trick-or-treating and all that. Here's why seniors should never trick-or-treat. You get winded just knocking at the door. Number two, they'll say nice mask and you're not even wearing one. <laughs> you, the first thing you say is, where's the bathroom? You ask for fiber treats. You'll be the only Power Ranger with a walker. You lose your balance when they drop the candy in the sack. You say, no caramel, please, my teeth comes out. You say trick or uh, trick or, uh, well, anyway, <laughs> you fall asleep in the porch swing. Those are some reasons why you shouldn't be out there. Did you find Acts chapter 4? I just want to read one verse. It's about Barnabas, and that's the name of the ministry. When I was resigning from the located ministry there at Galpolis, I served there for 29 years, and they had a belly full of me at the time to move on. <laughs> And uh, so I wanted to start a ministry, and we named it Barnabas Ministries because we wanted to be encouraging. And uh, here is where his name is first mentioned in Acts chapter 4, verse 36. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned, and he brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Now, would you bow with me for just have a word of prayer before we begin? Father God, we are grateful for your love and grace and these wonderful songs they sang about breaking the chains of sin that we might just in this life have the hope of eternity with you in heaven. And I pray, Father, you would bless us so that we might encourage one another to live more in the light of your word and in the leading of your spirit so that we bring glory and honor to you and are a blessing to one another. And we ask your grace for that this morning, Father, and we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. And when I began studying about Barnabas, because I hadn't done much, I was amazed how little I knew. And let me ask you a question. This is another raise your hand thing. How many of you think that his name is mentioned in the Bible five times or less? Raise your hand. How many of you think it's 25 times or more? Raise your hand. How many of you wouldn't raise your hand no matter what I said? That's what I thought, like most of you church Christ, Christian church people. <laughs> His name is mentioned 34 times in the NIV and 29 times in the King James. And the only reason there's a difference is sometimes they use the pronoun he rather than the proper name Barnabas. So they say the same, just sometimes they don't use his proper name. But that's a many more times than I thought. And I put together seven traits that really quickly found in the book of Acts about the man Barnabas. And if you and I would emulate those, and every one of them we can, if we emulate those, you would be a happier person, the church would be blessed and stronger, and God would be praised by the life you live. Now that's a good reason to do it, isn't it? And every one of these you can do. We're not talking about something beyond your ability. 
Every one of these you can do. So let's go over these. First name, he was an encourager, and that's obvious. That's what his name means. He was an encourager. And so we find that he, 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 he was a fool who utters all of his mind, but he says what is encouraging to other people. And it means, my Greek word means be in a state of courage or in a state of boldness. It's the opposite of discouraged. And it's positive. It's upbeat. It's happy. And so he's the kind of guy that brings that. A word fitly spoken in, is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. When we come to church, we come to get rather than to give praise to God and encouragement to one another. That's why we're here. If you read the second uh, chapter, or maybe the first chapter of Corinth, the 12th chapter, that we are here to build one another up. And that's exactly what he did, and you and I can do it. By the way, the, his name really wasn't Barnabas. His real name was Joe. Well, as you see, it's Joseph. But the apostles called him Barnabas because that's just the way he lived. And that's the way we ought to live, to say positive, encouraging things to other people. Some people brighten the room when they come in. Others brighten it when they leave. But you and I shouldn't be like that. We should be here to encourage one another. There's a fellow walking down an old country road one time. There was a fellow out there with just, with just had one mule pulling the plow. And he was saying, giddy up, Billy, Bob, Bubba, come on, Mary, come on, Jane, come on, calling all these names. And the guy walking down the road, he couldn't understand that, so he climbed over the fence and he goes and said, Mister, I've got to ask you a question. Yeah. He says, I noticed you're calling all those names and you only got one mule. He said, hush. I don't want the mule to know he's working alone. <laughs> and you and I are the same way. We ought to encourage one another. Know that others are on our team. We've got the same jersey. You and I should be an encourager. In Acts 13, he talked with them and he, he urged them to continue in the grace of God. That's just the way he did. Some people, like a football coach, would come into the, into the locker room and say, men, if we leave now, we'll beat the crowd. That's not very encouraging to your players. And you and I need to come to church for two purposes, to praise God and to encourage your brothers and sisters. And you can do that. You have that ability. You just need to say and think positively. Here's the other trait. He recognized potential in other people. It tells us in Acts 11 that Barnabas went to Tarsus to go looking for Saul. Other people were running from him. Other people were frightened of him. But he saw something in that man, now that he was converted, that could be used by God for his glory. Of course, he wrote 14 books of the, of the New Testament. So if Barnabas was right. He recognized potential. In Acts 9, 26, 27, but Barnabas told, took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how that Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how that in Damascus he preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. He recognized potential. And you need to do that as well. When you see someone in your congregation that has an ability, praise them and encourage them with that. John Mark, chapter 12. He took John Mark and when Paul didn't want him, he said, I'll take him. Well, he built him up and when Paul was in jail, who did he ask for? John Mark, the one that Barnabas took with him he learned some things with, from Barnabas along the way. He recognized potential in people. I had preachers call me, younger preachers, and say, you know, I don't know if I ought to go preaching or not. I said, well, there's only three votes that you need. Number one, do you have the desire? That's your vote. Have people told you that they see the ability in you? Well, yeah, they have. Have you had the opportunity? If you want to, that's your vote. If they see your ability, that's the people's vote. And if there's an opportunity to open up, that's God's vote. And we need to see other people, the opinion, what can they bring to the church to make it stronger? Look at the outward appearance. Well, that's no way. Look at the inside, look at the man, look at the woman, look at the one who has the ability. And so today we come to church to find fault. No, <laughs> that's sometimes what happens. See, leave your criticism outdoors. Leave your positive influence to encourage people with potential. Bring it in here and encourage them in that. Here's another trait. He was a trustworthy and a loyal friend. You could depend on him. Did you ever hear about the turtles that went on a picnic? 
I can tell by looking at you, you haven't. I'll tell you what they took along. They wanted to take the turtle tea, the turtle tortillas, and the turtle Twinkies. And when they got there and spread the blanket, they had left the Twinkies at home. They said, well, we can't start until we have our dessert. One of us is going to have to go back. So one of the turtles said, I'll go, but don't eat or drink anything until I get back. Now, promise. They said, okay. So they went over, leaned their little shells against a tree, tried to cross their legs, but they wouldn't work. And they rocked back and forth. And one of them said to the other, you know, I'm getting a little bit thirsty. I think I'll get into that tea. He says, you know, I think I'll do the same. And a voice came out of the, out of the brush and said, if you do, I'm not going to go. <laughs> Some people you can't depend on. But he was a trustworthy and loyal friend. When Paul was left for dead, everybody else would be in a dust trail getting out of town, but not Barnabas. He was a trustworthy and loyal friend. He stayed there in spite of the fact that the people who they thought had killed their friend, killed his friend, were there to kill him. And he didn't move. He's a trustworthy and loyal. Are you that way? You know, there's some people, and I shared yesterday, when I was at the church there, you assign people a job and you'd worry if it ever get done or not, and you had to keep checking. There are other people that you give them something to do, you can just rest assured it will be done. Either they'll do it or they'll see that it's done. That's what you and I ought to be, trustworthy and loyal friends. His cousin, Mark, got his fame just because of his relationship to him. He stayed for 14 years preaching, if you compare Acts 15 and Galatians 2, 1 and 9. He was a dependable, he would not quit. One fellow inherited a bunch of money and he went off to the world, and pretty soon he came back broke. He said, all my friends left me. But when did they leave? He said, half of them left when I lost the money. When the other half leave, he said, when they found it out. And that's the kind of people sometimes we have in the church. When rough times come, they're nowhere to be found. He was a trustworthy and loyal friend, and you and I need to be that as well. You can be a friend. You can recognize potential. You can encourage. And that's what you ought to be doing for one another. This church here, you could bust the walls if we'd all be doing that. But there's a fourth trait. He used his gifts for the Lord. He was a prophet. He was a teacher. In Acts 13, in the church of Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, and the first one named is Barnabas. He was set apart for that work. In Acts 14, it said he spoke effectively. Sergius Paul said he was a young, he was an intelligent man. I want to hear more from him. We need to do that. He was willing to be spent. He took a beating. He was ran out of town, but yet he hung in there. Somebody say a cross word to some of our church members, you haven't seen him again. This man stayed there and he used his abilities for the Lord. See, there's three ways to get things done. You do it. You can pay somebody to do it or tell your kids not to. But you and I need to be that kind of a person that will use whatever we've got for the Lord. Remember whenever they complained about, well, I can't talk as good as so-and-so. They say, well, who made your tongue? You know, or who made you different? Let me just shorten it. Who made you? The Lord. And whatever abilities you got can be used in the kingdom if you just be there and be a fit. You know, false humility is when I can't do it as good as somebody else. That's not an excuse. That's just false humility. There's a lot of things I can't do as some of our brothers in the church can. But I can do what I can do. And I can only do what God's given me, and I owe it to him because I, he owns me now. He paid for me by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he prayed for you. You know, I heard a story of a fellow who's a rich man. He put an ad in the paper. He had a beautiful daughter. He said, the one who will come and pass the test can either have all my land, all my money, or my daughter's hand in marriage. So they all showed up. He took them back in the back of his great mansion. And there was a swimming pool, Olympic size. He said, the first one to swim from this end to the other could have either my money, my land, or my daughter's hand in marriage. Nobody jumped in for a while because there was alligators and snakes and everything in the water. <laughs> Finally, there was a splash. A little fellow just almost tap danced across that water until they got to the other end. And he leaned up against the fence and he was wore out. Breathing heavy, he said, well, son, you win. Do you want uh, my money? He said, no. He said, you want my land because you can sell it and get more than the money. I No. You want my daughter? He said, I don't even want her. He said, what do you want? I want the name of that guy that pushed me. 
And I want you to know that's my job, that's my job is to push you. And that's what I'm here to do. We need to push one another. Here's another trait he had, he was bold. How can you encourage others if you yourself not encouraged? You cannot do it. And you'll find in Acts 13, 46, he had to speak the, we had to speak the word more boldly. Since you reject it and do not consider yourself worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. That took a lot of guts in the middle of a bunch of Jews to tell them you're gonna to turn to the Gentiles. If I had to tell young people one thing that they need to learn and that's stand alone. Don't join the crowd. You do what's right. And you and I need to do that. They spoke and then they shook the dust off their shoes because they wouldn't listen. The Bible says in Acts 14 3, he spoke the word more boldly. And Paul was dead and he stayed there anyway. We need to stand alone. And when you have done everything, stand. Young people learn to stand alone. That's a trait. You'll be valuable to the church and to the kingdom and to the world if you do that. He was a man of sound doctrine. That's the, that's the sixth trait. He had challenging time. Then Acts 15, he spoke. And the, he was a student of the, Bible, uh, of the Bible, and he would resist. He was a student of the Word of God. Acts 2, 13 talks about the fact that he was a man of the Word. Do you know that he was an apostle? Barnabas was an apostle? Yeah, Acts 14. It says the apostles, Barnabas and Paul. There are at least 16 by name in the Bible, the original 12, and of course Matthias when he was add, added, then Paul when he was added, and then uh, Barnabas when he was added, and Jesus is the apostle of God, it says. There's at least 16 in the Bible. Barnabas was one of them. He was a man of sound doctrine. But this last trait, it just makes all the others more beautiful. He was a humble man. I said the last, the fifth trait. He was a humble man. He was the apostle. He tore his clothes when they tried to worship him. He, didn't, he could do miracles. Boy, if you could do miracles, can you imagine the ego that would fill your soul if you could do that? But not this man. He was a very humble man. When they come to worship him, he tore his clothes. They don't do that. He was like the angels. When they, when they, in Revelation, said they worship the angels. They said, don't do that. Don't worship us. Worship God. And he was a humble man. Now, you and I can do these things. He was an apostle, an eloquent speaker, worked miracles, and yet he was humble. And any man can do that. Listen to this. He was the encourager Barnabas was. Wasn't Jesus encouraging? If you be like Barnabas, you be like Paul, I'd be like Jesus. He recognized potential. Barnabas did that. Didn't Jesus recognize potential when he chose Peter for the first preacher? He was a trustworthy and loyal friend. Barnabas, we say, he, and Jesus, was it he also, and isn't he still? We even sang about his trustworthiness. He's a loyal friend. He gave his talents to the church. Jesus gave his life for the church. Being like Barnabas, you'll be like Jesus. He was bold, not obnoxious. He knew what he believed. And of course, Jesus spoke as no man ever spoke. He was doctrinally sound, and Jesus gave us the doctrine. He is the doctrine, Jesus. To try to be like Barnabas, you'll be closer to being like Jesus. He was humble. We know Barnabas was, what it says, but wasn't Jesus more humble than anybody? If you had to be a perfect man, you'd be like Jesus. If you want to be a perfect woman who was tender and kind, you'd be like Jesus. If you try these traits in your life and you can do them, then the church would be stronger. I remember... When I used to travel, we got the audio books. That was a big thing for a while. And when I traveled, I put them in. And I would listen to these. And there was uh, Larry McVale uh, was the guy who took care of the contracts for the New York Yankees back in the 40s. I'm talking about 1940s. And there was a ball player that they paid $45,000. You say, well, there's, you can get jobs like that not back then. You could buy a new car for $800 back then. When he got $45,000, that was big bucks, but he didn't do very well. Time for Larry McVale to interview him and renegotiate the contract. He brought him back into his office. He said, you know, we pay for results around here. Yeah. We didn't get any results out of you last year. 
it's time for us to look at your contracts for the coming year. He said, I'm going to give you a piece of paper and you write how much you think you can live on and make a contract for. And I'll write on a paper what I think you're worth. We'll trade papers and then we'll talk. So Larry McVell looked him in the eye and wrote on his paper. The player, a little bit frightened, put down 36,000. It's a drop of 9,000, but 36,000 back then was still big bucks. 36,000, he wrote. He slipped it across, and Larry studied him again and wrote on his paper and slid it across, and he picked it up and saw 36,000. He said, now, pick up your paper. He opened that paper, and it said $45,000. Then Larry leaned across the desk and he said, would you like to play for what you think you're worth or do you want to start playing for what I think you're worth? He said, I think I'll start playing for what you think I'm worth. That player married Marilyn Monroe, used to sell Mr. Coffee. His name was Joe DiMaggio who set records that are still on the books this very day because somebody paid more for him than he had been worth. But he decided, I'll step up and be worth it. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you want to continue the life that you're living for what you think you're worth? Or do you want to live a life that Jesus thinks you're worth and gave his for you? That's a decision. You can be an encourager and see the potential. and You can do all those things. All you have to do is decide you're going to do it. not just be somebody that needs to be fed and cared for, but somebody who feeds and cares for others. The biggest gift that you can give to God is step outside yourself and start loving others by loving Him more. I'm going to have a prayer. And after a prayer, I'm going to ask Brother Mike if he'd come and receive you the invitation him. And you make up your mind. Do you want to be what you think you're worth or what God thinks you're worth? Make that decision this morning if you would. Would you bow with me, please? Our Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for your love and grace. Not nearly as grateful as we should be. We forget, Father, get tied up in our own activities and the things that are around us, the things we see. We just pray, Father, you would open our spiritual eyes more clearly Get the spiritual cataracts out of the way so our vision is clear. And we can see you and see others the way you see them and love them. Give us proper courage. Give us wisdom. And give us boldness, Father, to step up and be what you want us to be for your glory, not our own. We ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen.